Aloha and welcome to the Kapuna Wiki Radio Show. This month we are talking about senior housing and adult daycare centers. And in studio we have Glenn Furukawa, owner and uh, practitioner uh, with Furukawa Senior Services. Kapuna Wiki is Hawaii's senior resource. We talk to the best local professionals in the state regarding topics such as real estate, senior housing, estate planning, finance, and health. So our Kapuna families can find the best resources in the midst of a life transition. We strive to make sure our seniors are informed and supported every step of the way. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brandon Lau. And I'm Andrew Leon, your host for the Kapuna Wiki Radio Show. Our title sponsor for today is Cheney Brooks Choice Advisors, providing you with the best real estate information so you can make the most informed decisions. As I like to say, real estate is about choice. To contact them, call 753-9033. And now we have our Real Estate Tip of the Week, brought to you by Cheney Brooks Choice Advisors. Conveyance tax is also known as real estate tax. Is a tax imposed on the transfer of real property at the state, county, or municipal level. This tax is generally calculated as a percentage of the sales price. If the property is transferred for free, such as between family members, it may be exempt from conveyance tax. For more information on conveying real property, contact Cheney Brooks Choice Advisors at 753 Well, again, today in the studio we have the pleasure of speaking with Glenn Furukawa, uh, Director of Furukawa Senior Services. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for being on our show. Um, now, you've been in the services uh, service of seniors for quite some time, for a couple of decades now. And I know you uh, you own and operate your own um, daycare facilities. Uh, you consult with uh, many other senior service practitioners on the island. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit of about yourself, your background, and how you got involved in this field? Sure, thank you very much. Yes, so it's been seemingly a short time, but really in the calendar, it's been a long time. It's been about over two decades now. And in that time, we were able to create some, what I believe, some very special opportunities for our seniors in our community with some community-based businesses, such as adult daycare, as you mentioned, and also a type one arch, or adult residential care home. And so along the way, just learning a lot. Of course, it's our industry and the regulations have changed. So it's been uh, very interesting and hopefully, at the end of the day, most helpful for our families that we serve. And how did you get involved in this uh, area of service? What, what inspired you to do so? Mm, thank you, Brandon. Great question. I would really give most credit to my dear grandmother, a very special person in my life. And uh, grandma and grandpa, they had a really traditional Japanese home. And again, so as far as reading and writing and radio, television, speaking, everything, it was like being transplanted in Japan, right? including the delicious food. Yeah. <laughs> and so with that said, you know, I spent a lot of time with my dear grandparents, and they will be always some of the most special people in my life. And then it got to a point where they needed more care. I thought that it'd be a relatively easy transition, helping them to age in place and help them with services. And I thought that I would be able to coordinate that for them. Come to find it was a quite a tall order and surprisingly. And so that was really the genesis for me to kind of be aware of what was and was not available in our community mm -hmm. and then created some different opportunities. So not only my grandparents would benefit, but all the families that were in need of care would benefit. So are you looking specifically for senior care for Japan? Your grandparents who were Japanese speaking. Yes, yeah. and that's how it started, right? Mm -hmm. Because language is so fundamental and it's also very much related to how a person perceives the care that they're receiving. That is to say, if you can't communicate, it's very difficult to say, this hurts or this is what I need, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. It's very difficult without communication. Right. So in terms of care, that's how a person feels mm -hmm. about the care that they're receiving. And so what was really important, what I realized, is cultural sensitivity. And so the cultural sensitivity was to try to find people that understood not only the language but the culture, in my case it was the Japanese culture with my grandparents, but then to expand on that because they couldn't simply be unique in their experience, but it was an experience that everybody shared regardless of their ancestry. And so with that, yes, we were the very first Japanese-speaking senior care in the state of Hawaii. But then from there, we expanded on that so that with a wonderful staff that I get to work with, people with language skills in Ilocano, Tagalog, Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Japanese, 
we create a rainbow coalition of sorts where we're not exclusive, but rather we're inclusive with our cultural sensitivity. As far as your hiring practices, is, was that intentional to have people with all these different language capabilities be on staff? It is, and, and that's a great question, Brandon. I think that the only thing more important than the language skills is their heart. Mm -hmm. And I always say that I cannot train heart, so right. on the basis of that, I hire based on heart. Right, that's so true. So you started off first with a, was it an arch one? Um, adult resident care facility, or did you start off with a deep daycare? Exactly the other way. We started off by, uh, you know, getting things done first with adult daycare. Okay. And in our case, really, ignorance was bliss. We yeah. just kind of took the model of not what was available, but rather what would we want mm. at that age? What would we find to be enhancing and stimulating with dignity and respect would be most important? And the senior care model that has existed for so long is something that really, and it sounds harsh to say, but really it's a matter of storing and feeding. As long as we get those base minimum things done, then this yeah. can become senior care. Right. But in my mind, there's an opportunity with a paradigm shift not to give up on those that were older, but rather really to try to uplift and enhance. And this is a great opportunity for us to do that through socialization, arts, crafts, activities, excursions, entertainment, music, exercise on a daily basis. And it's absolutely amazing to see the kinds of changes, given the right opportunity, what people can do at any age. Now this daycare, is this the one in Moinili? Or the daycare we have uh, Pololo, okay. and that's the Furukawa Living Treasure that okay. is in Pololo. Right. And then after that, and now fast forward a number of years later, sitting in our local Costco, bumping into somebody that we've served for many years, and she said, Glenn, we have this house, and mom needs care. We know you have a full plate. Would you be interested in converting her house into a care home? Right. And so I realized that that was a story that I've heard many, many times from the family saying, hey, this is great. The service is wonderful. You're taking care of mom during the daytime. Weekends, we need help. And nighttime, we're really struggling. So again, that being part of the genesis of this whole plan moving forward to say we need to expand our services, not only daytime, 24-hour, right. and then we created the Type 1 Arch, or Adult Residential Care Home, which is located in Kaneohe. Oh, okay. So that was, uh, I guess, how, how long ago has that been? Oh, about 11 years ago now. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so both... Uh, both of them, both services, are recognized by the Department of Health. So certification from the Department of Health for our uh, adult daycare and for our adult residential care home, we have a license also from the Department of Health. So it, looked, it, it sounds like you kind of paved your own path to get to where you are. It and, was. Yeah, and along the way, you learned a lot. It was. Right? And it was really interesting because on the books, there were provisions, and when I say on the books, meaning from local government, be it city, county, state, there on the books there were provisions for such entities to be created, community-based services. Right. And I firmly believe in the community-based service model. Why? Because it kind of de-institutionalizes things, and it makes things smaller, more accessible, but also for families, especially for those loved ones suffering with dementia, it creates an environment that is familiar, maybe in their own neighborhood. And with that familiarity, that brings about comfort. So there were some allowances on the books, but at that time, we're going back 20 years ago, no one really knew how to execute that. Mm -hmm. So I went through a lot of work, and a lot of paperwork, and finally there's a very fine gentleman at the time, was, which was the Department of Human Services, who was handling at that time the daycares and he said Glenn you're a very stubborn person <laughs> and you're not gonna go away anytime soon and I said no steadfast, me. <laughs> steadfast. <laughs> I appreciate that thank you but there was a certain stubbornness about my desire and willingness to do what I felt was needed in our community for our seniors and so we created within a residential area mm -hmm. an adult daycare and of that size, that was the very first one in the state no kidding. that was allowed. Wow. With all the loops and hoops that we had to go through. Again, there are rules on the books that allowed for it, but you have to be willing to work through it all. And at that point, nobody had. So yeah. we did. That sounds so amazing because I mean, we do have uh, a 
good number of adult daycare facilities out there, but um, you're saying only 20 years ago the community model was originated. So it wasn't that long ago that this no. started, and now you have quite a number out there. Exactly. And But when you say community-based, uh, you had mentioned being within a neighborhood yes. versus a commercial setting. Yes, right. and, and thank you. That's a great distinction. So yeah. there were some very fine programs that existed then and still exist today, but there were larger settings. Right. And so what we wanted to do was bring that setting into a smaller setting that, again, familiarity and comfort and also something that was easily accessible so that it was difficult for some of the family members to talk their mom and dad into going into a larger type of setting with a lot of unfamiliar people. But their appetite was more for something that was scaled back, something that was smaller. So a house fit, and it just had not been done with that size at that time 20 years ago. Right. And now it's more popular, and gratefully I've helped a number of families start that way and businesses start that way. That's great. Now there's probably some uh, more hoops to go through, right, in a residential area. Yes. Um, you probably want the buy-in of the neighbors and let them know what's going on. And you have to worry about things like parking and traffic and all that kind of stuff. Um, how, how difficult is it for somebody to create a daycare or an arch one? It is, it's not an easy task yet. And one of the things I also do is business consultation. And so, in fact, just about an hour and a half ago, got a phone call from a gentleman who, because of the difficult economic times we're going through right now, he's saying, I want to start a new business, perhaps something in senior care, something that would be smaller on the size of, again, more community-based. And said, well, it sounds like a wonderful idea, and there's some great opportunities. Unfortunately, when I speak with people, I can sense, though, that their thought is, this will probably take, what, three months, four months? And no. And I think that we all understand that when you go through all the different government entities and get everything done correctly right. so that you are recognized by the government with right. all respect to Department of Health, Department of Human Services, whomever, then with that said, there is a way to do it correctly. And that does take time because, as you mentioned so well, Brandon, that it is a matter of being able to exist in harmony with your neighbors. Right. And that's really important. Right. So you'd say maybe on average to start a community-based uh, type of care facility could take one to two years, it sounds like. Easily, yeah. right? Because right. some of the different departments you're going through, um, a single department uh, without getting too technical could take anywhere from maybe 12 months on the short side to 18 months. Right. And then you're cleared for the next step. And right. then the next step takes more time and so on and so on. Because there could be things like construction involved, which requires permitting, right. and all these other types of things too. So it is a rather lengthy process, and uh, it's something that you'd really want to understand everything involved before you make that type of commitment, either with your time or your finances. Right. Well, Glenn, uh, that was a great introduction. You are a wealth of knowledge. Uh, when we come back, we want to hear a little bit more about your services and what you see uh, for the future of community-based home care. So we'll talk more about that right after this commercial break.